Welcome to this edition of On the Scene. I'm your host, Tim Kelly. Today's program, we're going to be talking about mosquito control and some of the viruses that come along with mosquitoes. So we'll have representatives not only from the Suffolk Mosquito Control Division, but also the Western Tidewater Health District to kind of complete the loop. A lot of great information coming up on today's program. Stay tuned. Welcome back to On the Scene. We have our two guests with us now to talk about mosquito control and also as far as some of the things you need to consider as far as what mosquitoes carry and diseases and things like that. So a real fun show today to talk about. And our two <laughs> experts here to cover these topics, we have Amal Patel, who's the District Epidemiologist with the Western Tidewater Health District, and Charles Abadam, who's the Mosquito Control Superintendent with the City of Suffolk. He's with the Department of Public Works, but again, mosquitoes are his game. So, gentlemen, thank you both for being with us today. No problem. No problem. Well, before we get to controlling mosquitoes, I want to talk about when we talk about what mosquitoes carry, what are we generally talking about? What types of diseases, both for humans as well as for animals as well? So um, for our area, West Nile virus is one of the predominant one that we see in Virginia, uh, followed by triple E, which is Eastern equine encephalitis. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the third one that's popped up recently is Zika. Zika is not endemic, meaning it's not found in mosquitoes here. All the cases in Virginia have been from uh, Zika endemic areas in the Caribbean, um, other parts of North America, and brought here. Got it. So uh, the main disease we'd look for is West Nile virus in humans. Mm -hmm. Triple E can cause human illness. It's uh, more rare that it causes human illness. It's more. Um, of a threat to horses. That's why keeping horses up to date and vaccinations is very important Correct. Uh, to protect against triple E. What have we seen, say, in the last couple of years when it comes to these diseases in our area? Um, has it been a high prevalence or not so much? Or what have you generally seen? In our area, yes. we haven't had any human cases of West Nile virus or triple E. Okay. Um, we've had a few Zika uh, cases, but again, those were imported, Correct. not uh, domestic cases. But um, again, I'll leave it to Charles to talk about the mosquitoes yes. and you know, the potential viruses they carry. Correct. But um, it's still something to be concerned about. West Nile virus um, is, it um, usually has mild symptoms. Most people don't even know they had it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, uh, it can cause severe illness, but that's in like about 10% of the cases that do show any symptoms. Right. And the population most at risk is the 50 plus population. Got it. Uh, for triple E, um, anyone can get triple E, but again, it's very rare. Correct. Um, the problem with triple E, it can cause severe illness. Um, one of the, uh, if you do have severe illness, one of it is encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's always prudent to protect yourself against getting those. There are no treatments, right. there are no vaccines. Mm -hmm. So the best method to protect yourself is a uh, topic we're going to cover is how right. to protect yourself from mosquitoes. Got it. And, and sort of in a general sense, I want to back up for just a second. When it comes to the Western Tidewater Health District, what is y'all's role in what we're talking about today when it comes, certainly you're not doing mosquito control, you're not doing spraying, but as far as when these viruses or, 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 or diseases pop up, where do y'all come into play with that? How do y'all coordinate? Certainly working with Charles and other mosquito control agencies in our area. Sure. So my job at the health district is the epidemiologist. I receive lab reports and um, um, if a doctor diagnoses a patient with West Nile virus or triple E, I get those reports. It's up to me to start investigating. So that will mean looking into lab work, looking at um, physician notes mm -hmm. and calling the uh, case patient as we call them right. and to uh, determine whether it fits the case definition of that disease. And if so, um, one of the things that we've recently been working on, especially with mosquito control, is how to release that information to them. Because again, we're talking about HIPAA-related um, issues. Correct. So uh, one of the strategies we've developed is to ask that person, is it all right to share, not the disease, but the information right. about where they reside, not the specific address, but maybe the neighborhood with mosquito right. control. So mm -hmm. if it, was a domestic transmission, mosquito control will know that and maybe step up enforcement in that area or whatnot, but I'll leave that uh, sure. for Charles to expand on. So Charles, shifting into that, um, certainly I know you oversee the mosquito control program mm -hmm. here in the city of Suffolk. In a broad sense, what do, what do you and the men and women who work for you, work with you to, to you know, work on this, this goal as far as you know, keeping the mosquito population as, as low as possible and certainly hitting those areas? In a general sense, when we talk about mosquito control, what are we talking about? 
we're basically identifying populations of mosquitoes that could be a threat to public health. Got it. And then other than that, we are also finding those populations that are nuisance species that can cause just difficulty being outside. But as far as public health is concerned, we're identifying mosquitoes that we catch in our traps, our adult mosquitoes. Those uh, mosquitoes are then identified to species, and it's particular species that can actually transmit those diseases, uh, a West Nile and Triple E. Um, and we also have mosquitoes that can um, transmit Zika, and that particular mosquito, which is a tiger mosquito, isn't the primary vector. It's not the main mosquito that transmits that disease, but it has the potential to. Um, and it has the potential to be a vector or a transmitter of a lot of exotic species, exotic diseases that come into the area. Right. Um, it's just uh, one of those um, kind of generalist mosquitoes that is everywhere and has um, the ability to um, inhabit a lot of different environments, uh, especially around Suffolk and in a lot of cities um, throughout the United States and sure. just the United States in general. So what we're doing is identifying those areas where those populations are highest mm -hmm. and then um, taking care of them, killing them, decreasing their populations so that they don't either hatch out as uh, adults or when they are adults, we are um, taking care of the adult population. Now you mentioned testing. Mm -hmm. What does that actually entail? Um, testing. Um, what we do is we take those adult mosquitoes mm -hmm. and then we t test those particular species that are vectors for those diseases um, and we test them for West Nile Triple E. Right. Um, we don't currently have the um, ability in our office and our lab to test for Zika, but um, we have the all the connections and the collaborations with other labs like DCLS uh, um, in Richmond to be able to test those mosquitoes for the uh, for exotic species uh, for exotic diseases. Now, as far as mosquito control, as far as what is y'all's methodology for when you have certainly again, there, there's really two I guess two approaches. You have the adult ones, mm -hmm. which are active and out and about, and then you also have the larva, mm -hmm. which again we we'll talk about that with mosquito dunks and some mm -hmm. of the things that are offered to the general sure. population here, or residents here. But your approach with both of those, as far as I know, it's two different kind of ways to tackle it. How do y'all yeah. go about doing what you do in that respect? So actually, a mosquito goes through a, a full metamorphosis. So they're just like a butterfly, so they go through an egg, a larvae, a pupae, and an adult phase. Right. So um, we can actually treat in three of those stages. Um, the eggs are kind of dormant, so we can't really treat for the eggs. They're waiting for a particular, um, you know, the water table to come up in the habitat that they're laid in order to be laid. Um, but we can pre-treat for the larvae that hatch out for those, from those eggs. So um, what we're doing is taking care of larvae, um, placing uh, insecticides or pesticides in the habitats that those larvae are in and then they feed on that larvae and they will, will essentially die from what they fed on. It's basically a bacteria. There are other things called insect growth regulators that can be placed in the water and allow the larvae to not fully develop into an adult phase. Um, the pupil stage and the fourth stage of a larvae and the pupil stage, uh, they both don't feed. So what we're, we usually do is we apply what's called a monomolecular film. It's a film that goes on top of the water and it prevents them from breathing, so they suffocate. Right. Um, so the pupae can't, can't breathe, they die. The larvae can't breathe, they die. Um, thus preventing them from becoming adults and the insect growth regulator as well prevents them from becoming adults. Um, and then if we aren't, we don't get to those phases, mm -hmm. then we can get to the, uh, we can identify the adults in our traps and know that there's a population out there that we need to take care of, okay. uh, whether that's from a truck mounted spray or a handheld adulticide spray. Um, we can do a number of those different types of techniques in order to be able to decrease populations. Now certainly through your testing, you're, you're kind of getting a feel for where the populations are and kind of what's going on out there. Mm -hmm. But again, residents can also pick up the phone and call. They can submit uh, service requests mm -hmm. online and do that as well. So between the general public and as well as your team, kind of a dual approach as far as finding Absolutely. out where the problem is and certainly cutting it off as early in the process mm -hmm. as you can. 
as well as monitoring things as we go along, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Citizens can play a very vital role in uh, helping us identify if there's a population in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They can uh, call us uh, via the phone, they can go through the website and place a service request, sure. they can email us as well. Right. Um, and we're, we definitely have begun to receive service requests yes. from around the city. Yes. Um, right now, a lot of people are seeing a lot of crane flies and midges and gnats, and those gnats and midges can bite. So um, I think people are mistaking all the insect activity for mosquito activity. Correct. There is some mosquito activity out there, Correct. and we are um, trapping for those individuals. Right. But um, right now, I think what we're seeing is high populations of flies as well, mm -hmm. uh, gnats, midges, and right. crane flies. And it, when we talk about, I mean, certainly the conditions have to be at a certain point to really facilitate the mosquito growth of the population kind of booming right there. Mm -hmm. And we're kind of, based on the spring we've had so far, really yeah. not been optimal for their growth, which right. has actually been good for us. Yeah, I mean, uh, lar uh, mosquito larvae and pupae can actually survive in some pretty cold temperature waters. Right. Um, so if anything, we're finding them in the larval form more so than we are as adults. Um, but the adults are hatching out. Yes. Uh, it's just a very inconsistent a weather pattern that we've been having for right. this beginning of the year. Right. It's cool. Um, sometimes it gets really hot, then it'll cool down like yeah. 30 degrees. It's a very large jump yeah. um, as far as the, like the temperature inversion sure. uh, in the evening. Mm -hmm. So. Now, one thing you've mentioned a couple times, water which really is what we're talking about. No, mm -hmm. tip and toss is, is a phrase that you've used before. Sure. We talk about that. So what can people do on their own part to kind of prevent this and kind of help uh, control that population on their own? Yeah, uh, a weekly check on your home, mm -hmm. uh, finding anything that's holding water, dumping that, uh, tipping it over. If it's just garbage or trash that's holding water, please sure. throw that away. Yeah. Um, we also provide uh, mosquito dunks for um, our citizens, they can pick up one packet a month at their local fire station and city hall, uh, the libraries, but they can place those in waters that can't be tipped and tossed, you know, like right. little ponds and, right. and ruts and, and uh, 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 ditches as well. So um, that's uh, definitely a way that they can help themselves, but a weekly check is most important because if you forget, then the mosquito has the ability within that week to actually hatch out, you know. and. Just a just another side note on the whole uh, the weather pattern thing. Sure. Um, as far as adults are concerned, yes, they'll hatch out, but we have a difficult time being able to spray as well when it when the weather isn't consistently above 50 degrees. So when the weather does drop below, our our pesticide has a, a very hard time interacting. Um, it's cold, and, and the active ingredients are, it's difficult for them to actually do what they do. So it, it is very difficult for us to schedule anything right now because we can't, we don't know if what we're doing is gonna be actually doing any, any real impact on their population. Now, this question will be for both of you. Um, certainly, Amal, I know your organization covers a, an area, a territory. Charles, I know you're focused on the city of Suffolk, mm -hmm. but. I'm sure, sure the two of you work with partners in and around the area to kind of get an idea of what's coming, what's happening, because if it's happening in a neighboring community, it very well could be happening here in Suffolk or again throughout the Western Tidewater region, correct? Correct. Um, uh, Suffolk Mosquito Control for Western Tidewater is I think the only mosquito control we have mm. in, in the district, which includes okay. Isle of Wight County and Franklin City and Southampton County. Sure. So um, I work with Charles, but I know Charles, he'll answer this, he works with right. the other mm -hmm. mosquito control sure. districts in yeah. our Hampton Roads. Gotcha. Yeah, I think everybody's kind of ramping up right now. Right. April right. Uh, is the time where everything begins. Uh, Everybody's getting their surveillance together. They're getting their technicians attuned to what's happening out there. Sure. Um, they're doing inspections. They're doing um, larval checks mm -hmm. and um, trapping and just seeing what's out there now to prepare for what's about to come. Got it. Um, mm -hmm. It's still a very difficult thing to uh, predict what's going to happen, sure. but everything is in place for them to be able to detect when it is happening. Right. And I know certainly activity will have a lot to do with this, but suggestions from both of you with regard to people to help prevent themselves from getting bit. I mean, certainly time of activity. I know a mosquito population, I know they're, they're peak, they have peak hours. Mm -hmm. um, I know it can come down to, to color or types of clothing and things like that, mm -hmm. certainly uh, using um, uh, uh, 
you know, off-the-shelf uh, mosquito uh, prevention materials yeah, yeah. and things yeah. like mm -hmm. that. But I'm curious, feedback, what, what y'all have kind of found to be maybe the best measures for people to take and the safest ones for them as well. Well, um, obviously clothing is one thing. You want to limit how much skin is exposed. Right. Uh, so obviously we do have hot summers here. So uh, the recommendation usually is to wear light fitting, uh, light colored clothing. Mm -hmm preferably long sleeves, but obviously that's probably not going to happen. Right. So that's where, you know, the uh, insect propellant comes in yes. and, you know, use that on any exposed skin. Mm -hmm. Again, like you had said, the activities, I'm not sure exactly what the high activity hours are, but right. Avo right. try to avoid as best possible outdoor activity during those times. Got it. Yeah. And Charles, where would those times kind of come into play? I mean, they def definitely are different for every species, right. but um, g in general, um, an hour before sunset, a couple hours after sunset mm -hmm. um, um there is that kind of so people kind of confuse what what's sunset and what's twilight so that time in between to twilight is a really good time for mosquitoes as well right um generally when you like to be out <laughs> mosquitoes <laughs> like to be out funny so, how that works huh? yeah. yeah it <laughs> is i mean they're just like us uh, right. as as far as they like those temperatures as well um but yeah loose long light colored clothing um, and any repellents that you can use. And no, you know, I, I usually say I don't have a, a recommendation because I think people, the people's makeup and their body and their body chemistry are different. So the way that their body interacts with the repellents that they choose um, uh, may be better than someone else. So, right. you know, try what you can, try a different one and see if one works better than the other. And then that's kind of where you should go. You know, is there anything to one individual versus another individual repellent aside being more susceptible for a mosquito to bite them? I know there, there's, you hear people say that sometimes. I don't know if that's even true. Uh, it is actually yeah. people. I, I mean, we're all living beings and we all process um, our nutrition and our nutrients differently. So what, whatever, you know, people sweat differently. Right. You know, so if someone is sweating differently or, or if someone doesn't sweat at all, that they're going to be more, those that are more sweat, that have more sweat are and more attraction um, to, attractive to mosquitoes because the chemicals in their body are being exuded from them. Right. You know, so it really does depend on, on, on the individual. I know people that are highly attractive to mosquitoes and, <laughs> and uh, others that are not, you right. know? And I, I see the difference between uh, my biologist and my whole crew and I, yes. you know? So some people are, like I said, highly attractive and others are not. And that's just based off, you know, your diet, mm -hmm. the way that you live, and just you know, maybe even your genetics, you right. know? So there are a lot of things that um, can uh, attract you to a mosquito. And sure. they're always doing research on this. And I think that they've, uh, recently I saw a paper about um, how they've isolated the gene or, or the gene for mosquito sensing of particular um, chemicals mm -hmm. and they're by a by being able to isolate that they're able to maybe possibly make new repellents Got and it. whatnot Got so it. it's, it's, it's kind of interesting work very good yeah and I know we talked about the sharing of information between your two organizations and Charles talk about as far as if you through your testing you're, you're seeing things or things how is that information or what information types of stuff is being shared with them all and his team as well sure I mean I think that's an ongoing process that's a living thing right, right. now right. I think we're trying to better communicate with you guys mm -hmm. and I think that you guys are also um, trying to increase your communication to us. And when I know that it's very heavy and we're seeing a lot, I make sure that I contact them all, or contact yes. the health department. Yes. And, um, and I know that whenever we get positive humans, which is, we're very lucky in Suffolk to not have any human cases of right. both West Nile or Triple E, but sure. I'm sure that if we did, right. a mall would be yes. on top of right. it. And I know typically we'll see that media release come from, from your area, come out there and certainly have the connection with, mm -hmm. with Mosquito Control backing up with some of the tips and information about people to be a little more, I use the phrase loosely, mosquito safe, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the, I guess you guys have the lead on one aspect, you certainly have the lead on the other and working together to make sure, again, we're keeping conditions as, as safe as we can, but also letting people know informationally what's going on out yeah. there. And again, uh, the, the, the two organizations working together to make sure that information is out there and people are informed. Um, I know we have a couple minutes left, so I kind of want to just open it up for both of you to any any closing comments with regard to um, your thoughts on the on the subject that we've been talking about today. And certainly, Amal, I know when it comes to your organization, 
you're not just looking at, at what viruses mosquitoes carry, but other insects as well when it plays into that, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, just one last note on sure. Zika because, uh, again, you know, it's, it's an imported disease at this moment. But uh, w one thing to make note of, if, if a couple is deciding to, have, uh, you know, uh, carry on a pregnancy or um, become pregnant, right. it's very important they talk to their physician, especially if they're planning any trips or baby moons to beach locales, because that's where they might encounter Zika carrying mosquitoes. Correct. And um, Zika really doesn't have very um, severe, uh, uh, like in the person who has Zika, it's not usually very severe symptoms, it's very mild, mm -hmm. but in a developing fetus, it can be very deadly. Right. Microcephaly, uh, deformed limbs, and other issues um, that will be a lifelong issue for that child when they're right. born. So it's very important that any individuals that are thinking about having a pregnancy speak with their physician if, yes. they've, if they've been to an area like that right. or are thinking about going to an area like that. Got it. And then again, um, uh, Charles and I, before this started, we're talking about ticks. Um, uh, this area has a lot of ticks, obviously, and they also have a lot of ticks that do carry some of those diseases like Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever mm -hmm. and other uh, bacterial Ill illnesses like that. So again, that's another issue that um, you know people need to be aware of. Correct, and again, the summer months, people out and about, out in interacting with nature in different realms or even just in your own backyard, you never know when these things will come into play, correct? Correct. Very good. Yeah. Charles? I mean, I, I think I just want to make sure people are aware that Suffolk, we always have West Nile virus. We always have triple E. And I want horse owners to know that they need, they should vaccinate for triple E right. and they should get their boosters for triple E. Yes. Um, it's a very, it's cheaper than having your horse die. Right. You know, right. And, and having to go through all this process if you sure. want to keep your horse alive. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and then just to let the people know that, um, you know, the season is upon us. Yes. It will be coming, there will be mosquitoes, and there will mos be mosquitoes with the, these diseases. Correct. And um, we are doing our best to decrease those populations and um, we we'll wanna let them know, you know, right. that the information will be out there. Uh, it's not something that is uncommon in this area that the mosquitoes would be transmitting the, these diseases. Um, Usually through the bird population, you know that's where it, where it all kind of starts, and then and then out and about, you know. So um, also with, with ticks, it's it, it's also good to be aware of ticks and where ticks would be. There's a huge deer population in Suffolk, right. you know, and there are a lot of rodents and bears and deers that can be holding these ticks, and and we want them to make sure that you know they're if they know they're going into a place with high grass to maybe try to tuck your um, jeans or your pants into your socks and then apply uh, a repellent to your, your, your boots, your shoes, your socks, and your, your pants. Because ticks crawl up. Uh, they, don't, they don't usually fall from the trees. They're usually on the ground and they crawl up. So it is a good prevention thing. And, and there are a lot of ticks in here. You know, mosquitoes fly. <laughs> but it's a little bit, you know, more simpler to um, to do tick prevention. Sure. But also, they are very sneaky, <laughs> you know, and they will get into these cracks and crevices. So right. do a tick check when you're when you get back home and you feel safe, you know, and and um, I don't know, just being aware that they they should do all they can to not get bit by these insects. Understood. Mm -hmm. Understood. Well, again, I appreciate the time, both you and the information you shared with us and our audience today. Mm -hmm. Ball and Charles, again, thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. That will do it for this edition of On the Scene. I'm your host, Tim Kelly. We will see you next time.